Great. I want to thank all the organizers of the International Aid Society and all the technical support we've had to bring this to you virtually and really to be able to talk about the progress toward the global commitments using the UNAIDS framework and bringing together the Global Fund and PEPFAR resources to meet the needs of individuals around the globe with prevention and treatment resources. As you can see from this slide, PEPFAR has continuously aligned its funding with the burden of disease. And this is similar with the Global Fund, bringing resources together to both treat and prevent new infections. PEPFAR has continued to evolve through the history of PEPFAR, very much focused on the emergency at the beginning, expanding our sustainability, and critically now bringing together deep data analyses to make sure that we know precisely where the epidemic is, precisely how we're meeting the needs of the individuals we're serving, both with prevention and treatment resources. We are guided by our three pillars that really focus on accountability, transparency, all directed at achieving greater impact. And I know everyone in the field is doing this at this time, even though it's a difficult time, with the combination of COVID-19 and overlapping pandemics between HIV, TB, and malaria, and COVID-19. PEPFAR continues to provide absolutely critical support in making program data visual, making it available, both to the community and to the government so that everybody is working from the same information to know precisely what we're doing at the most granular level so we can constantly improve programming. And then ensuring that the communities are at the forefront of the planning. Over the last five years, we've focused more and more in bringing the communities not only to the table for planning, but also for funding and funding their implementation and really increasing community monitoring to improve the quality of our programs, both of our prevention programs and our treatment programs, and then focused on exactly what things should cost, not what we're spending, to make these programs sustainable and cost-effective in, in the future. And then really increasing our coordination with the Global Fund. And I just want to thank the new UN AIDS director and Peter Sands of the Global Fund for really throughout this difficult period to staying in tight communication to ensure that we're bringing everything that we can to bear in the countries that are hit by all four of these pandemics now, COVID-19, TB, HIV, and malaria. Our key goals for 2020 were really to sustain the gains and ensure treatment retention, accelerate the control in the countries that have not really achieved control of their pandemic, and then ensuring we're addressing the rising new infections among key populations in our most vulnerable groups. These were our goals before COVID, these are our goals after COVID, but we all as a community need to continually analyze and make sure that we're staying true to our goals and serving the needs of the community, whether it be that overlap between HIV and TB or that overlap between HIV, TB and COVID. We've used qualitative and quantitative data to continue to evolve our program, and this has been really key. When we saw poor viral load suppression in children, we immediately looked to address why was that happening and really looked to eliminate nevirapine out of our program. When we saw the majority of the severe adverse events occurring in young, young men undergoing circumcision, we changed the age in which we do circumcision to ensure that there is do no harm in our prevention activities. And then really within index testing, listening to the community to ensure that index testing, which is family testing and community testing and index testing is done with a sensitivity to the needs of the population. Despite COVID, through these first six months of our programming, we've been able to continue to achieve our goals from treatment of 16.5 million individuals to almost 25 million circumcisions, continuing to serve our orphans and vulnerable children, and then ensuring through our DREAMS program, a program focused on the future of young women to prevent HIV and meet them where they are with the structural interventions that can change their future, ensure that remain HIV negative. This is just a summary of all of our community-led household surveys, and I want to continually thank CDC and ICAP and now University of Maryland, who've been working in partnership with us, going into the community level, using program data as we've described, but then validating that program data through these community-based surveys. And you can see the results across the board. And we go from a low of about 35, 40% of community viral load suppression 
all the way up to achieving the goals set out by UNAIDS with over 75% of the community virally suppressed. In each of these countries, it's a combination of sustaining the gains, ensuring or meeting the needs of each individuals at the same time and improving the areas where we need to improve in those, those countries where the community viral load suppression is lower. At the programmatic level, so those were surveys, at the programmatic level, it's very clear who we've left behind in viral load suppression. These are individuals in general less than 35, but you can also see with children between one and four and the older children five and nine, we need to still do incredible work here to ensure that we're reaching every child, that they're on regiments the most effective regimens that can have the biggest impact on ensuring that they remain virally load suppressed. At the same time, we maintain our focus on key populations to ensure that we're focusing on each and every key population from MSMs to sex worker to people who inject drugs to our trans community to make sure every single community has has access to both prevention and treatment services and they were meeting each of the community members where they are to ensure that they can achieve viral suppression. We're very proud of these numbers across the communities and we can see that we need to continue to do work to improve viral load suppression in closed settings such as prisons. As you know, retention has been an issue for us and an issue for the Global Fund, particularly in putting young people and young people and really asymptomatic people onto treatment where they haven't experienced the ravages of HIV, where they haven't seen the, the unbelievable impact that HIV has had along the growth in the last 30, 35 years. And really, bringing messages to them of the importance of viral load suppression. And so we are seeing our primary loss to follow up, our young persons under 35, and those were initially early initiation onto ART, and really working with each individual to make sure we're meeting their needs. In fact, in this slide, you can see very clearly that the highest loss to follow up is very similar to the issues that we're having with viral load suppression. And so we can see with children under four, children four to five, and 20 to 24 year olds, we're having a significant loss of follow up, while patients over 40 have a much lower loss to follow up rate. It is the granularity and the specificity of this program data taken to the community level, working with community leaders in each of these different ages to ensure that we're bringing the best programming that meets the needs of each and every individuals so individuals can be retained. Understanding that it is our job to meet the community and the individuals where they are to ensure that they can be successful in their treatment. The role of community-led monitoring, which is really groundbreaking through the Global Fund, we over the last three years have been learning from the Global Fund and the community-led groups to really improve and fund directly community-led monitoring, where we're working on continuous quality improvement, hearing the voices of those that we serve to make sure our service delivery continues to meet the needs where they are with successful treatment and also prevention activities. The peers and the CSOs have been critical in helping us eliminate user fees in West and West Central Africa, and then really holding us and governments accountable to that elimination of user fees. So what we continue to work with community groups at the level of the clinic, hearing their voices and funding them to go into the clinic and interview clients and making sure that both the data that we're receiving from the facilities and the data we're receiving from the community groups match. And then we use that to do continuous community improvement. Throughout and as part of our 2020 COP preparation, We've made it clear that each country needs to be specifically funding community-led monitoring. And already we're seeing that impact of what community groups can do to really improve the quality of our services, whether they're prevention or treatment services, from Mozambique to South Africa to Vietnam. I think many of you know we've been focused on TB preventive therapy over the last 36 months, really accelerating and focusing on improving the uptake of TB preventive therapy for everyone that's on ART and every one of our clients that need this really effective service. 
In the first two quarters, we reached more than we did all of last year. We're tracking this very closely and we're tracking the impact now over the next two quarters of COVID-19 and its impact on our service delivery and programming. Turning a moment to pediatrics, although our pediatric numbers are steadily declining of HIV infection of young children, and we are seeing that decline, we are also continuing year after year finding a large group of children under 15 that are HIV positive, that haven't been tested and haven't been put into treatment services. Even this year, you can see that we found over 55,000 children above the age of one who desperately need to be on ART. And you can see that dark turquoise bar still shows the number of children between 10 and 14 who have survived a very long time on, with HIV, who need to receive treatment services. Finding these children, we have found the most effective way is to go into family index testing, finding those parents that are HIV positive, and then ensuring that we're testing all the children in the household, independent of age. Our OVC program, our Orphans and Vulnerable Children's program, has been in deep partnership with us over the last three years to really work with those households and link our Orphans and Vulnerable Children's program at the very initial time that we find the parent to ensure that there's household support for each and every child and that family, taking the most vulnerable family and making sure that we're meeting their needs. This has improved our viral suppression in our OVC programs as they continue to reach out and reach over 4 million children. And really, you can see the impact that they have had on retention. And I want to thank all of our OVC programs out there and our local providers who are continuing at the community level to serve the needs of our households during this very difficult time of these four pandemics coming together, particularly in resource limited settings of Sub-Saharan Africa, where we're seeing the impact of COVID-19, TB, HIV, and malaria coming together in a unique way. And I just want to use this opportunity to thank the OVC program directors for not only the work that they've done to get us to this point, to improve the lives of children and the households with HIV, but also always attentive to these, this new pandemic and serving those needs through this difficult time of this pandemic. I want to thank the, the Vatican and the work that the Pope and others there have done to really improve the treatment of young children and the work that we're seeing with the FDA and other regulatories to improve the access to, to DTG. This improvement and this access will ensure that nearly every child has access to the most advanced treatment, the treatment that is safer, the treatment that is more effective, and the treatment that will keep them virally suppressed. Turning our attention to dreams, determined resilience, empowered, AIDS-free, mentored, and safe young women. A really signature program of PEPFAR. It has done so well. You know, we continue to increase its investment in young women in preventing HIV. You know, we continue to increase the geographic reach of dreams and over the last 12 months we've really intentionally worked at a very high level with the global fund to ensure every single thing is coordinated and maximum programming is available to every young woman in the most vulnerable areas of sub-saharan africa and haiti it's now on nearly a billion dollar investment this year. It will be over a billion dollars and it's bringing together the public and private sectors as well as Global Fund and PEPFAR to work together to have a bigger impact to save more young women's lives to ensure they grow up HIV negative. That core package has been continuously strengthened with the views and opinions and funding directly to young women, putting them at our center while we continue to address the issues that we see in the community, while we continue to focus on gender-based violence, and sexual violence in young women's lives while we continue to focus on finding young men and ensuring they also are treated or circumcised to decrease the transmission to young women and working with the communities and faith communities and the communities in general to really wrap their arms around young women and ensure that they grow up as the vibrant young women that we know they are and continue to be.
Dreams has had a tremendous impact. These structural interventions work. We knew they worked early on by the deep scientific evidence, but as we brought all of the scientific evidence together into a combined layered program where we meet the needs of young women where they are and provide us a layer of structural interventions that are focused on their needs every day with a constant feedback loop, our DREAMS ambassadors and our DREAMS leaders within each of these programs constantly modify these programs. It's always a privilege to me to be out as I was in Rwanda meeting with Dreams Girls um, around World AIDS Days to really hear from them and hear how we can constantly improve that program. And that has resulted in ever more impact year over year. We've increased the districts, we've increased the funding, we've increased the geographic focus, we've increased the ability for every single country to have dreams-like activities. Our Orphans and Vulnerable Children's Program has really stepped up and provided that continuity in both linking the dreams-like programs and dreams programming that we have on the ground to reach more young women each year. This year already, we've reached 1.5 million young women. Critically, we've reached them with violence prevention interventions, both for themselves and at the community level, and supporting over 130,000 young women to stay in school, complete their education, and be the leaders that we know they are capable of. In addition, we continue to accelerate PrEP. You can see the PrEP acceleration in the first two quarters of this year shown in the peach bars. We will continue to focus on access even during this difficult time of COVID and making sure we're putting information out through the communities and safe spaces to ensure that young women are getting the messages not only on HIV prevention, but COVID-19 prevention. Turning briefly to cervical cancer, with the Bush Institute and the continued leadership with Merck and other private sectors, along with our UNA's um, counterparts, we've been continuously increasing our investment in preventing cervical cancer among our most vulnerable in sub-Saharan Africa and resource limited settings, where we know cervical cancer is the largest problem of cancers in young women. Investing in these programs to ensure that HIV positive young women have access to screening throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. We are really pleased to announce that we've reached now 1 million women over the last 18 months to really focus in the most vulnerable and reaching young women with this important screening and critically shown in the gray bars. We've been able in the first two quarters to really increase the number of individuals that are screened but also treated for cervical cancer. From precancerous lesions and that treatment, but also referrals to ensure that those who have invasive cervical cancer and those who have more complications have access to treatment. Now looking at voluntary medical male circumcision, as I opened with, we're really focusing on not only improving the programming and access and really improving the access for 15 to 29 year olds, but also making it clear across Sub-Saharan Africa that we do not want young boys circumcised due to the incidences of severe adverse events in that group, particularly among the sexual immature. And we are seeing an improvement in circumcisions that are being offered. You can see now we're almost to 25 million circumcisions provided through this program. We're very proud of this program and we're proud of the implementation in the countries where you can see they have improved that gray band. That is our 15 to 29 year olds. That's where we know we'll have the biggest impact on preventing new infections, but also providing a safe preventive services to young men around Sub-Saharan Africa. In my last few minutes, I wanna talk about how PEPFAR has been supporting our COVID response, building on the amazing health systems investments that we have made. We've made over $900 million, almost a billion dollars annually into health systems, but it's the platforms that we've built together and the community's relationships that are going to be our solutions, not only for HIV, but our response to COVID-19 around the world. These health platforms and particularly the lab platforms, the viral load platforms that we have built together 
are the very platforms that are using to detect COVID-19. If we had not had those RNA platforms throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, today we would not be able to diagnose COVID-19. And if we had not worked together with communities to build that capacity, as well as the health systems and the clinical capacity and really increasing the number of healthcare workers down to the lowest level of implementation of health services throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, we would not have the response we have today. At the same time as a program, we have the team in PEPFAR from the leadership of Anjali Atriker and the entire team who has been working constantly throughout Sub-Saharan Africa to make sure that we are both helping the ministries of health to respond to COVID-19, at the same time focused on really improving and maintaining and sustaining our critical life-saving services to individuals that need it for HIV. I am grateful for every country and ministers of health who really worked with us to do multi-month dispensing. Those countries that led in that multi-month dispensing are leading now in ensuring that people stay on ART. These things that we do are important. And at the time, it may seem like an abstract concept, but that work is resulting in saving people's lives today as they have access to six months worth of drug supply. So really working to maximize retention, the multi-month description, the decentralized drug delivery, and creating virtual platforms of communication like we have and IAS has to make this available to people around the world. Critical right now has been, because of our inability in some cases for our international partners to be on the ground, our work to build local partnerships and fund our indigenous partners has been really critical. Those are the individuals along with our incredible embassy staff that are sustaining these programs now as many cannot travel. And so I just wanted to finish with an update on how we are doing with the local partner transition that we're doing in a careful and deliberate way. I am grateful to USAID and CDC and DOD who have been working on this for the number of years. It is saving lives now and allowing us to both provide essential HIV services as well as COVID interventions. CDC will achieve the goal of achieving 70% investment in local indigenous organizations. You can see in this slide, the dark countries, the number of countries that have made that progress to more than 70% and the work that we have to do in other countries. And I'm so proud of the work of USAID, who's now achieved 53% from a low of 35% just two years ago. They will reach very close to the 70% within the next 12 to 18 months of funding cycles. It is that work that we did together that is allowing us now to sustain the gains in this very difficult time because it's our local partners who remain on the ground along with our, our embassy personnel. And I wanna thank each and every one of our embassy local staff and our USG staff there that have worked tirelessly in this pandemic to ensure access. So I wanna finish where I started. Our goals of continuous coordination with the Global Fund and community set us up to be able to sustain and maintain as many gains as we can for prevention and treatment during this difficult time of the intermixing of pandemics throughout the world. And I wanna thank each of the staff that work tirelessly every day to maintain and ensure our progress in treatment and prevention is maintained. And to make sure that we're meeting communities where they are with the resources and the technical guidance that they need to be successful. So I wanna thank each and every one of you for the incredible work that you do every day. I wanna thank IIS for this ability to really meet together virtually. And thank all of you who are listening. Thank you. Thank you.